اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم و بہی نستعین والصلاة والسلام على خیر الخلق و خاتم الانبیاء والمرسلین سیدن الاولین والآخرین شفی المدنبین رحمت للعالمین و حبیب الہ العالمین و صلی اللہ علیک یا سیدی یا مولای یا رسول اللہ و علی احل بیتک المذلومین صلی اللہ علیک یا سیدی یا مولای مولای و ابن مولای یا ابا عبداللہ یا رحمت اللہ الواسع و یا باب نجات العمہ یا غریب یا مذلوم یا اتشان کربلا ما خواب من تمسك بكم والأمنا من لجأ إليكم سادتي يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا ماكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق والأستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والشعراء يتبعهم الغاوون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله عليه وسلم Tonight as we all know is the night of the first of the month of Muharram amongst the four sacred months within Islamic tradition which even in the pre-Islamic period was designated as a month of sanctity whereby bloodshed was forbidden to be shed. Yet if we fast forward only 50 years after the passing of the greatest of God's creation, the Messenger of God, Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, See, his grandson was left alone on a barren desert, around 30,000 horsemen ready to shed his blood. What went wrong? What transpired? And why is it that every single year we come toward a gathering like this one to recollect that tragedy, which is a tragedy like none other? Someone says, how can it be a tragedy like none other? Like I stated before, we're talking 50 years after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, and he lived with that grandson of his. And he placed him on his back and on his shoulders, and he would call out Al Hassani wal Hussein, Rayhan Atai. He would call out Al Hassani wal Hussein, Sayyida Shabab Ahl al Jannah, that Hassan and Hussein are the leaders of the youth of paradise. He would call out, Husaynun minni wa ana min al Husayn, that Husayn is from me and I am from Husayn. He would call out and he would state, Ahabb Allah man ahabba Husayna, that Allah loves the one who loves Husayn. Statement after statement and tradition after tradition speaks to the close attachment that the Messenger of God had for Sayyid al Shahada al Husayn, salamu alayhi. And evidence after evidence suggests that it was the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam who would weep over the tragedy of Hussein as he would foretell it toward his companions and toward his family members. So thus we come in walking in the footsteps of the greatest of God's creation, the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa ala. He told us that God loves the one who loves Hussein. I don't have a lot of good deeds. I don't have a lot of things to demonstrate in front of my Creator that this is what should permit me to enter into paradise. But one thing that I do have is that I love Hussein. And I will utilize the words of the Prophet of God in front of God and I will say, your messenger said that you love the one who loves Hussein. So bear witness that I love Hussein. And we come toward these gatherings over the last 400, 1400 years to recollect a tragedy. 
in a way that's been done with so many unique rituals in order to enliven the story and the merit that we gain and the value that we earn from being in the proximity to the gathering that recollects the tragedy of Hussein. Last year, on the first night of the month of Muharram, I spoke to the importance of symbolism and ritual within Islamic tradition. And I don't want to speak toward that tonight, because it's something that we've conversed about in the past and it's available as well, online and other platforms and so on and so forth. But tonight I want to dedicate my conversation toward speaking to the importance of the poetry that we recite in honor of Sayyid al-Shahada al-Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. If you go all across the world, tonight is the first night of the month of Muharram. There are more than 300 million people in this universe who are gathering and they are weeping and grieving and lamenting over the tragedy of the grandson of the Messenger of God. And the most salient feature of these mourning and lamenting ceremonies is the poetry that we recite that begins us into entering into the majlis, the recitation, the khutbah, the sermon in of itself. And it's that same poetry that we sort of transmit all across the world, you'll find culturally, in different parts of the world, in different communities, that recitation in the way of Hussein in order to invoke emotion from the audience is a staple of Islamic tradition. And when we go ahead and take a look at the uniqueness of lamenting for Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, we see that its historical roots are founded far before the tragedy of Karbala and that which transpired on the day of Ashura. Rather, poetry within Islamic history and really pre-Islamic history as well has been something that is so foundational and so fundamental. For those of you who have an understanding of the whole Qur'an, you know that the whole Qur'an is virtually poetry from beginning to end. And what makes it so unique for the early Arabs during that day, which was an evidence that the Prophet ﷺ was actually a prophet toward his community in Mecca, was the beauty of the words of the Qur'an. If you study pre-Islamic Arabia, Western scholars and Orientalists, they will write the same. They will say that there were no people who were as eloquent as the Arabs of that day. They would converse and they would speak in poetry. And they would actually sit down with one another and they would try to out-poet the other person who was sitting in front of them. They would have poetry battles, in other words. And actually you find that Historians, they state that if someone insulted the person that they were trying to out-poet, they would get their wealth, they would get their property, sometimes they would even get their spouses. Thus you see that poetry was such a fundamental sort of core of that environment in the pre-Islamic period. And thus when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he brings forth his message, and that is the whole Qur'an, we see the beauty of the words of the whole Qur'an, as a mechanism to influence the hearts of the cream of the crop when it comes to the poets in the land of Hijaz. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you read the whole of Qur'an, you'll see how the words are so unique and so delicate, and how many of the verses of the whole of Qur'an, they are rhyming in prose and so on and so forth. And you saw that that was the greatest evidence used by His Messenger, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So for the sake of our discussion and our conversation for tonight, insha'Allah, I want to speak toward the importance of lamentation poetry within Islamic history. And I want to explain this particular concept in three different dimensions. The first dimension is in terms of understanding the history of poetry within Islam. Secondly, in regards toward the history of poetry in honor of the Prophet and his family, alayhi salatu wasalam. And thirdly, the uniqueness of lamentation poetry in honor of Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam. So as for the first dimension of our discussion, in terms of understanding the history of poetry within Islamic tradition. Again, as I mentioned, poetry is that which is founded within the whole of Qur'an. And that which is really evident in the pre-Islamic period as well. But when you go ahead and take a look at the life of the Prophet وسلم, we don't have any necessary evidence to suggest that he himself was a poet or he himself recited poetry. 
Because at the end of the day, the only thing that he recited was the verses of the whole of Qur'an and that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired for him to state. And many scholars of Islamic theology, they would state that the reason why the Prophet ﷺ would not speak his own poetry is because people in the community would mistake it for the whole of Qur'an because again, his word is similar to the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْحَوَى That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states within the whole of Qur'an that the Prophet does not speak anything except for revelation. When we go ahead and take a look at those who are closest around the Prophet ﷺ, we see individuals like Abu Talib, the uncle of the Messenger of God, the father of Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, one of the evidences that we use to suggest that he was a man of faith and a man of Iman was his prose and his poetry in honor of the Messenger ﷺ. If you go to classic Arabic bookstores and libraries in the Middle East today, you can actually go and find books that are entitled Diwan Abu Talib, the prose of Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet And You go ahead and you read these lines and the way that he praises the Messenger of God and the way that he speaks of his love and his affection and his attachment toward the Prophet you see that these lines of poetry, number one, are so beautiful, but number two, they also demonstrate the uniqueness of the faith of Abu Talib. And that really gets us to understand again the meaning of poetry in and of itself. Poetry is a way that one expresses that which is within their innermost feelings. We have a very difficult time talking about things in general, especially in this part of the world. It gets very uncomfortable to say things like, I love you, I care about you, how are you doing? But not how are you doing in a way that we're just being polite, but that we actually care how the other person is doing. For whatever reason, we come and we see that an avenue in order to express those innermost intimate feelings that we have, and really across different cultures and different world traditions in general, is poetry. You go ahead, for instance, to any like bookstore, are there even bookstores around anymore? Right? Is there Barnes and Nobles anymore? Everybody buys things on Amazon. Back in the day, when you would go to a bookstore, you would go to the section on religious studies or on Islam, or maybe I was the only one hanging out in those areas. You go to the section on Islam, and every single poem, or the, 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 or the majority of books in the Islam section is poetry of Rumi, for instance, or poetry of this guy, or poetry of that guy. And most of it had nothing to do with God in and of itself. It had to do with love. It had to do with uh, intimacy. It had to do with affection, and so on and so forth. Poetry is something that just people like in general. I think until today, people still put poems on the signatures of their emails and all of these other strange things because they're afraid to just say the things that they want to say very directly to another person. But also what it does, again, is show the uniqueness of certain individuals. And sort of, again, the depth of that which they desire to speak, the depth of their emotion. So you find the example of Abu Talib on sort of one lens. And you find other poets, a man by the name of Hassan ibn Thabit, for instance. Hassan ibn Thabit was a man who was known to be amongst the greatest of poets during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And on the day of the Ghadir in which the Prophet ﷺ, he appoints Imam Ali السلام, as a successor and as the Imam after him, when he states, مَنْ كُنْتُ مَوْلَى فَهَذَا عَلِيٌ مَوْلَى اللَّهُمَّ الْوَالِ مَنْ وَالَى وَالْآدِ مَنْ آدَى the Prophet ﷺ, he calls this man Hassan ibn Thabit, this poet, and he says, Oh Hassan, you are a man with great eloquence. Stand in front of everyone and recite your lines. And he recites these really beautiful lines in praise of Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, in which he states that the word mawla means imam, and the word mawla means hadi, again, and we utilize it as an evidence in discussions and so on and so forth to speak about the superiority of Ali alayhi salam to all of the other companions of the Prophet of God and the Prophet alayhi salam he goes toward Hassan ibn Thabit and he says oh my dear friend utilize this poetry and utilize this tongue of yours in our service and we have evidence that later on within history Hassan ibn Thabit no longer did that so the Prophet alayhi salam was warning him of what he might do meaning that he lost his loyalty for the Prophet and his family, alayhim salatu wasalam. But as we go ahead, we see that the first time that we find remnants of lamentation poetry, in other words, poetry 
that sort of evoked emotion or invoked emotion of the audience was after the Prophet ﷺ lost his uncle Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. When you go ahead and study early Islamic history, the life of the Prophet ﷺ, there was not one moment that was as tragic to the life of the Prophet ﷺ as when he lost his uncle Hamza in the Battle of Uhud. He would grieve day and night. And it struck his heart so deeply that even when his killer, Wahshi, came toward the Prophet ﷺ to convert to the religion of Islam as he did many years later, the Prophet ﷺ had a difficult time to even look at Wahshi. He took his shahada and he accepted him into the religion of Islam, but the Prophet ﷺ still had that deep grief that ran through his heart even years later. So when someone says, why do you grieve over something that happened a long time ago? The Prophet ﷺ also grieved for many years after the passing of Hamza ibn Abd al-Muttalib. Anyhow, we come and we see that after the passing of Hamza, the Prophet ﷺ, he would go towards some poets within the community. And he would ask them to recite lines of poetry that spoke toward the merits of Hamza. Meaning, again, that he would ask poets to speak about the uniqueness of Hamza in order that everyone within the community misses him in a way that it would invoke tears from the audience. And according to one tradition, it is stated that the Prophet ﷺ, he gathers together women, and he gathers together men, and he separates them on two sides. He asks one woman poet to stand in front of the women and recite poetry in honor of Hamza in order for the women to grieve. And then he asks one man to recite poetry in honor of Hamza in order for the men to grieve. And communally they wept and they grieved over the loss of someone who was so significant. But again, he wasn't only grieving over an individual who was a man who was the uncle of the Prophet But Hamza السلام, was far greater than that. Not only is he the uncle of the Prophet, but he's a confidant of the Prophet. And he's a man who stands in representation in supporting the mission of God. So we don't weep for our grandfathers, our great-grandparents, our ancestors in the way that we weep for Hussein, or the way that we weep for the family of the Prophet ﷺ, because they have a uniqueness in terms of their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in order for us to demonstrate our love for Hussein in the same way that God states, Allah man ahabba Husayna, we grieve in this way in order to bring forth an evidence to suggest why it is that I love Hussein salam in front of our Creator. We can say how many tears did I shed and how many gatherings did I enter into and how many times did I wear dark colored clothing in order to demonstrate my love and my affection toward the grandson of the Messenger of God. And this brings me toward the second phase of my discussion, which is the second dimension in which I want to speak a little bit toward the history of poetry in honor of the Prophet and his family, alayhim salam. Because someone says, okay, let's suggest that the Prophet, alayhi salam, did accept grieving over Hamza ibn Abd al-Muttalib, but that was the direct commandment of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Why is it that you grieve over other personalities other than Hamza? And how come we don't grieve over Hamza necessarily only? We go and we see that poetry in itself has something that also has been deeply entrenched in the post-prophetic period. If you go toward Masjid al-Nabawi and you go and you visit the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all that most beautiful opportunity. Many of us in this room, we just came back from Hajj, there's nothing like being in the proximity toward the Prophet of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You go and you walk around the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and you'll find lines of poetry in honor of the Messenger of God alayhi salatu wasalam. That even in that community and in that society and in that socio-political lens, if you understand what I'm saying, that even they permit the recitation of poetry in honor of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And I just want to read a couple of those most <coughs> well-known lines in honor of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. For instance, in one famous poem that many of us may have taken to memory, the poem it goes, بَلَغَ الْأُلَى بِكَمَالِهِ كَشَفَ الدُّجَى بِجَمَالِهِ حَسُنَتْ جَمِيءُ خَسَالِهِ 
that this famous poem was written by a scholar who was trying to do something in dedication toward the Messenger of God So he states that he reaches the peak of perfection with his etiquette. And by his beauty he removed all darkness. And he had the entirety of all good character. And when he went to sleep that night, and for those of you who understand the Arabic language, it rhymes and it sounds a lot better than it does in English. He went to sleep that night and he saw the Prophet وسلم, come to him in his dream. And he said, Oh Shaykh, read the poem. So he said, And the Prophet والسلام, says, Finish it. So he says, I don't have the words. He says, Then let me finish it for you. Sallu alayhi wa alihi. And praise Muhammad and his family. Allah has Another sort of really beautiful poem that we have within our tradition in honor of the Messenger of God وسلم, is by Imam Shafi'i, one of the four Imams of the Sunni Madahib, the Shafi'i school. One of his famous poems states, Ya Ahl Bayti Rasulillahi Hubbukumu Faradum Min Allahi Fil Qur'ani Anzalahu Kafakum Min Adim Al Qadri Annakumu Man Lam Yusalli Alaykum he states, O oh, family of the Messenger of God, love has been made an obligation to you within the whole of Qur'an. And it is sufficient for your position and your stance that if someone does not recite salawat upon you and your family, their prayers are not accepted. Who is he? This is Imam al-Shafi'i. Imam al-Shafi'i in another poem, he states, In kana rafadan hubbu ali muhammadin fal yashhad thaqalani anni rafadiyun. You know, one of the ways that many people, they sort of isolate Shia, is they call them the rafadi, individuals who reject. Because of a difference in opinion in regards to succession to the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. They call us the rejectors because we reject the authority of the first caliph and we believe that authority should be given to Ali alayhi So a demeaning way to speak toward followers of Ahlul Bayt, toward the Shia, is you call them a Rafadi. And in this line, Imam al-Shafi, again, who is not Shi, he states that if love of the family of the Prophet allows for you to be known as a Rafadi, then I swear by all men and by jinn that I am a Rafadi. You find numerous examples about praising not only the Prophet وسلم, but also his family Ahlul Bayt And it's really important to understand that when we come here in these gatherings toward praising Imam Hussein السلام, and the poetry and the way that we do, again, it's nothing except for out of our love of the Messenger of God we come here and we grieve because it was the Prophet who grieved. We come here and we dress in this way in our garment of grief because God has told us by the word and by the tongue of the Messenger of God that He loves the one who loves Hussein. And so again you find all of these unique examples and all of this poetry that has been dedicated in honor of the Prophet and his family to demonstrate that there is no one in terms of merit, in terms of beauty, in terms of compassion, in terms of generosity, in terms of patience, in terms of love, in terms of any sublime metaphysical virtue, in terms of comparison with not only Muhammad, but also Wa'ali Muhammad, alayhi salatu wa Which is why there was this man, his name was Ibn Sakit. Ibn Sakit was a companion of the tenth Imam, Imam Ali al Hadi alayhi salam. And he lives during the time of Mutawakkil al Abbasi, who was one of the Abbasid Khulafa. And Mutawakkil al Abbasi was also responsible for poisoning our ninth Imam Muhammad al Jawad alayhi salam. But nonetheless, Mutawakkil, after poisoning Imam al Jawad alayhi salam, he went toward Ibn Sakit, again, who was a companion of the tenth Imam, and was a man who was super eloquent. He was a scholar of the Arabic language, he was a poet in his own right. 
And so he goes to him and he says that, Oh, Ibn Sakid, I want you to teach my two sons. I want you to teach my two sons Quran, and I want you to teach them the Arabic language. Imagine Ibn Sakit is the greatest Arabic scholar of the time, right? And he is being asked to teach two children who are four and five years old. He wants to say no, but he's also being told by the leader of the Muslim world, who is a tyrant and an oppressor in his own right, you can't really say no to somebody like that. Because it's going to be detrimental perhaps to your own life, naturally. So Ibn Sakit says, look, I don't think that I'm the best guy to do it. So he says, like, look, you're going to teach my two sons. So he says, okay. So every single day for several months, he would go and he would teach the two sons of Mutawakkil al-Abbas, the Arabic and Quranic language, and so on and so forth. And one day, Mutawakkil al-Abbas, he goes toward him. He goes toward Ibn Sakit. And Mutawakkil had really strong animosity toward Ahl al-Bayt, alayhim salam. Really strong animosity. Again, he think he's the killer of Muhammad Jawad salam. He did his very best toward, you know, killing and slaughtering the Shia of Ahl al-Bayt, really all across the world. He is one of those who tried to demolish the shrine of Imam al-Hussein salam many, many years ago. He goes toward Ibn Sakit and he says, Oh, Ibn Sakit, tell me, who is better in Quran and in Arabic? My two sons or Hassan and Hussein? Ibn Sakit. For himself, he was willing to take it. For himself, he was willing to allow, for himself to be forced to be in that position where he has to teach the two sons of this despicable tyrant. That the minute that this man tries to compare anyone to Hassan and Hussein, Ibn Sakit he couldn't keep quiet anymore. Interestingly enough, Ibn Sakit means the son of the one who is quiet. If you understand the uniqueness. So he states to Mutawakkal uh, al-Abbasi, he says, Ya Mutawakkal. He says, Inna al-Qambara afdal min waladayk. He states, Hassan and Hussein, ajunint. He states, Oh Mutawakkal, have you gone crazy? You're comparing your two sons to Hassan and Hussein? Qambar, the slave of Ali, the slave of Hassan and Hussein, is better than your two sons. At that moment, Mutawakkal al-Abbasi, he takes him, he ties him to a pillar, and he cuts off his tongue, and he lets him bleed to death. This is the way that the leaders of the Muslim world treated individuals who had animosity, or who had love, who had this sort of intense love toward the Prophet and his family, In other instances, you find that Ahlul Bayt and the poetry that was recited for them was something that was very much embedded and very normal even during the time of the Khulafa from Banu Umayyah, for instance. You find individuals like Farazda. Farazda was known to be the poet of Hisham, Hisham bin Abdul Malik bin Marwan, who was again one of the Umayyad Khulafa, and who was responsible for really isolating and marginalizing Imam Ali ibn Hussein, Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam, after Karbala. And it is said that Farazda, he was paid, he was employed by the Umayyad government to go in public gatherings, to stand next to the uh, caliph, and just speak about his praises in really, really beautiful words. And people, this is the way they used to be entertained. Sometimes we turn on like Fox News for 30 seconds just so we can laugh a little bit. Back then they used to go and watch a poet praise the caliph, and everyone used to clap and stand up and do all of these silly things. So they would actually have someone who is the voice of the government, who was employed by the government, and Farazda was that man for Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, who was one of the Umayyad Khulafa. He's standing to the side, and he's trying to go and perform tawaf around the Kaaba. If you go for, uh, if you go for Hajj, in the, like, the peak days, you can't just stand on the side if you want to do tawaf. You gotta get in, it takes a little bit of time, you gotta navigate through people, you gotta get comfortable, and then you got to make sure that your left shoulder is facing the Kaaba and performing all the rituals in the way that we perform the rituals. It's not easy. Hisham ibn Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he's looking at all of his ministers and he's like, I am Hisham ibn Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. I am the leader of the Muslim world. No one is letting me enter. During Hajj, no one really cares who you are. They're just trying to fulfill their responsibility to your God. So he's trying to get in and he's fancy robes and trying to get into tawaf and no one really cares who he is. All of a sudden, a couple of moments later, there is a man who comes and he's wearing this really long garment and he has a scarf that's covering his head. 
and he's walking really slowly and he's calling out subhanallah walhamdulillah wa la ilaha illallah and he's making really really small steps and when he enters into that gathering and within Masjid al-Haram everyone looks and they see the beauty of his face and he takes steps and everyone parts and they allow for him to enter into the middle and before he performs tawaf he goes and he puts his hand on Hajar al-Aswad and no one touches him and he puts his face and he kisses Hajar al-Aswad and then he takes one step back and he begins to recite A'man and he begins to recite Dua in a really beautiful voice and he begins to recite adhkar when he says la ilaha illallah everyone in the mataf they say la ilaha illallah he calls out Allahu Akbar and everyone after him they call out Allahu Akbar he says subhanallah and everyone within masjid al-haram they say subhanallah <laughs> Shaham ibn Abdul Malik one of his guards one of his bodyguards they look and they say who's that? and Shaham ibn Abdul Malik says keep quiet we don't know who he is it doesn't matter who he is and at this moment, Farazda, who is the poet of Hisham ibn Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he says, what are you talking about? You don't know who he is? Of course you know who he is. Excuse me. Huh? <laughs> That if you who, do not know who this man is, this is the man who Mecca knows, and this is the man who the outsides of Mecca know. He is the son of Fatima, if you did not know. By him and by his grandfather, all of the prophets were in completion. He is the son of Ali, and he is the son of Fatima, and he is the son of Hussein. How do you not know who he is? And at that moment, as he was reciting these lines of poetry, the guards of Banu Umayyah, they took him and they put him into prison. And because this man, he had really absolutely nothing except for his position in the government of Banu Umayyah, Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salatu wasalam, he sends him 10,000 dirham, which was a whole lot of money. To which he responds in a letter toward Imam Zayn al-Abideen, he says, Oh, son of the messenger of God, I didn't do this because I wanted any wealth from you. He said, I did it out of my love for you and out of my love for your Creator. To which Imam Zayn al-Abideen writes back to Farazdaq while he was in prison. He tells him, O oh, Farazdaq, you take this 10,000 dirham and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't decrease your reward. So we come and we see that the history of poetry in honor of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, was something that was present during their lifetime. And this allows for me to transition into the third dimension of my discussion, and that is specifically in regards toward lamentation poetry in honor of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. And we find that lamentation of lamentation poetry in honor of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam can only be understood in sort of two subtopics. The first subtopic is that Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam they themselves would encourage the recitation of lamentation poetry in honor of Imam al Hussein sallallahu alayhi And the second sort of subtopic is that they themselves would recite poetry in honor of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam themselves. So let's try to understand both of these two points really, really briefly, and then I'll conclude. Firstly, in regards toward the encouragement of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam in regards to a recit reciting lamentation poetry, marthiyah, in honor of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, we have an abundance of ahadith and an abundance of traditions. For instance, one tradition that states that the one who recites one prose, who recites one line of poetry in honor of Ahlul Bayt, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant him a house in paradise. Another tradition, for instance, states that the one who recites one line of poetry and allows for 50 people to grieve in that audience, for 50 people to shed a tear in that audience in honor of us, meaning in honor of the Prophet and his family, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant him paradise. And then at that moment, the companion, he goes toward Imam al sadiq and he says, 50 people, that's it? All I have to do is make 50 people cry? So he says, no, 40 people. If you recite one line of poetry and 40 people cry, Allah will grant you paradise. He says, 40 people, that's it? He says, no. 
If you recite one line of poetry and you make 30 people cry, Allah will grant you paradise. He says 30 people and he continues 20, 10. He says 10 people, Ya ibn Rasulullah. Just for one line of poetry that makes people grieve in honor of Ahlul Bayt. And Imam Sadiq says no. He says if you recite one line of poetry and one person cries, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you paradise and everyone within that gathering. And this man, he began to cry. And Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, Oh my dear friend, no. He says, if you recite one line of poetry in honor of my grandfather Hussein, and one person in the audience tries to cry, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant everyone within that gathering paradise. Another tradition states, Man baka, aw abaka, aw tabaka, falahu al-jannah. That the one who cries in honor of us, or the one who makes others cry in honor of us, or the one who tries to cry in honor of us, all of them have paradise. Again, in a way to encourage people to recite poetry in honor of Ahlul Bayt, alayhimu salatu wa salam, one line in their house in paradise. You recite lines of poetry that cause people to lament. Everyone gets paradise. We're just giving out paradise like Oprah gives out cars here. <laughs> just paradise for everybody. But it starts with the fundamental principle. And that starts with this idea and this notion. That it has to come with the sincerity of our love for Ahlul Bayt. Alayhim salatu wasalam. And he said that one day Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam went for Hajj. And he was accompanied by his companion, a man whose name is Kumayt ibn Zayd al-Asadi. This man is a legend, my friends. Kumayt ibn Zayd al-Asadi, if you like poetry for Imam al-Husayn salam, you have to know this guy's name. Kumayt ibn Zayd al-Asadi gave everything in the way of Ahlul Bayt To the extent that both Banu Umayyah and later Banu Abbas, they tried to target his life numerous times. He was on their hit list. So the only reason that he would read poetry for Ahlul Bayt, specifically in honor of Imam al-Hussein, Salaamu Alaihi. It is said that they were standing in front of the Kaaba, And it is said that uh, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he looks toward Kumayt and he says, Oh Kumayt, I want to remember my grandfather Hussein. Let's just stop here for just one moment. They're in front of the Kaaba, They're in front of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's the best act to be performed when you're in Masjid al-Haram? Tawaf, prayers, Quran, Dua, Munajat, Adhkar. Imam al-Baqir, the great grandson of the Messenger of God, what does he state? I want to remember my grandfather Hussein. He comes from the lineage of infallibility and purity. And in front of the house of Allah, he wants to remember Imam al-Hussein, salam Allah. He says, recite me some lines so that I may grieve over the tragedy of my grandfather, Hussein. To, recite, to, to that moment, he recites a couple of lines and the Imam, alayhi salam, he begins to cry. And then Imam al-Baqir, he stands up and he raises his hands and he says, Oh Allah, I ask you by the blessing of your Kaaba to forgive the sins of Kumayt. Those sins which he has committed and those sins which he has not yet committed. In another occasion, it is said that Kumayt ibn Zayd al-Asadi, he was captured. Uh, he was taken into prison by the caliph of the time, and Kumayt al-Asadi, he needed a ransom of some exorbitant amount of money. So Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he went to his family members, and he said, Kumayt, he is our poet, he has dedicated so much to us, he has dedicated his life to us, to the extent that now he's in prison. They all gathered wealth in order to pay for the ransom of Kumayt, so that he's, so that he's bailed out of prison. And Kumayt, he says, O Messenger of God, on another occasion. He says, O Messenger of God, all of this wealth that you keep on showering me with, I don't need it. I don't, I, I don't need anything. To which the Imam salam, says, but I want to give it to you. Because I love when you read for us. I love when you recite for us. Kumayt, he responds toward Imam al-Baqir salam. He says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, O grandson of the Messenger of God, none of this matters to me. Just give me one of your shirts. Give me one of your cloaks which he has inherited from the Messenger of God so I can be buried in that so it can intercede for me on the Day of Judgment. Again, you have to take a look at the sincerity of the poet too and the love that he has to the Prophet and his family. Peace and blessings be upon them. 
On another occasion, it is said that Imam Zain al Abidin, alayhi salam, the fourth Imam, he is in Mina. The days of Hajj, again, since we sort of just left those days and it's on a lot of our minds, the days of Hajj they consist of a lot of ritual, right? From the moment that you get into Mecca, you perform Umrah at Tamatta, you perform Sa'i, you perform prayers, and you perform other Tawaf, and then the day of Arafah happens, and on the night of the tenth you go to Muzdalifah, then you have to perform certain rituals in Mina on the day of Eid al-Abha, and on the eleventh and the twelfth you have to go and stone the Jamarat. But when you're in Mina, other than stoning the Jamarat, which takes fifteen minutes max, you don't have anything to do. People always ask, what should we do? Should we recite this du'a? Should we make that prayer? What should we do? Most of them just sit and they just sleep as much as they can because of how exhausted that they are during the course of those days. And they, you know, stand on lines for these really, really disgusting bathrooms for the majority of the days when they're in Mina. It is said that Imam Zayn al-Abideen, alayhi salam, he is in Hajj with many of his companions. <coughs> and they're sitting down and they're talking and they're conversing and they're talking about nothing which is very common during the days in Mina. To which Imam Zayn al-Abideen says, which one of you is a poet? One of those companions, he said, O Messenger of God, I am. I can read a little bit. He says, then recite poetry in honor of my grandfather, in, in, in honor of my father, Hussein. It is said that he would recite poetry for Imam Hussein Hussain. He would weep and then Imam Zayn al-Abideen would ask everyone who was in Mina, he said, whatever you can gift to this man, gift it to him. Because he has reminded us of the tragedy of my father, Hussein. On another occasion it is said, again, just sort of to elaborate the emphasis on poetry in honor of Ahlul Bayt, and specifically in honor of lamenting for Hussein in this mode of poetry, it is said that Imam Al-Kadhim, Sallallahu Alaihi he was brought by Harun al-Abbasi, the Abbasid Caliph, toward the city of Baghdad, where eventually he was martyred. And the Abbasid Caliphate, they were really, really prone on doing one thing. And that was to always demonstrate how much they loved Ahlul Bayt. We love the family of the Prophet, we are related to the family of the Prophet because the Abbasids, they come from the lineage of Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib. But many of that which they did was very antagonistic toward the family of the Prophet. They used it as their rallying cry in order to take power, but once they had power they oppressed the family of the Prophet more than anyone else. So in order to allow for this public image to take place and to transpire, they bring forth Imam Musa al And he sits down on the throne next to Ma- Ma- Harun al-Abbasi. And he invites all of the ministers and all of the people who work in the court to gift whatever it is that they want to gift to Imam al Khadim alayhi salam so they can take like their photo op and all that kind of thing. So everyone comes and they give some fruits and they give some gold and they give some unique things because when the tyrant commands something everyone just has to obey. And he says, I command you to give all of this to Musa al-Kadim. Imam Musa ibn Jafar doesn't care about any of these things, but he's in a position where he has to accept them. So he sits and he's accepting and he's accepting and he's accepting. There was one servant within that court who didn't have anything to offer. So he comes and he looks at Harun al-Abbasi, his boss, and he says, Oh Harun, I have nothing to give the grandson of the Messenger of God. So he says, you have to give something. So he looks to Imam Musa al-Kadim and he says, Oh grandson of the Messenger of God, I love you and I love your family. He says, I don't have anything physical to offer to you. I'm a really poor man. I clean up after the shoes. And I clean up the I, I, I clean up next to the shoes of this hall, for instance. To which the Imam Ali Salam says, Don't worry about it. He says, But I do have one thing for you. He says, And what's that? He says, I have a couple of lines of poetry that I recited in honor of your grandfather Hussein. So he recites these lines of poetry in honor of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Imam al-Kadim then begins to weep. Then he takes all of those gifts that he has been receiving from all of these ministers and he says, this is all for you, I don't need anything of it. So on one side we see that poetry was that which was encouraged by Imam, by the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam by means of their tradition, by means of their words, by means of their custom. They had hadiths that spoke to the merit of reciting poetry, and they actually honored those who recited on their behalf. And on the other side, we see that Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salatu wasalam, they would read poetry on their own in honor of Hussein and in honor of their and, and, and in honor of their immaculate lineage. And we find numerous examples of that as well. 
We find that, for instance, that when the family of the Prophet of God, they were returning back toward Medina after the tragedy of Karbara, we find that, for instance, Um Kulthum, she begins to recite lines of poetry, in which she says, O oh, city of Medina, do not accept us. Because when we left your blessed city, we had all of our men and we had all of our family. But today we come with none of them. We have other instances, for instance, when Lady Zainab السلام, would utter some lines of prose in order to allow for herself to grieve and for others to grieve during those most challenging days after the day of Ashura. We find instances, for instance, when the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they themselves would encourage others, other poets, to recite poetry like that of Da'bad al khuzai of Imam al-Rabba alayhi salam, in which he would recite the Masaib of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and when he would stop, Imam al-Rabba would continue the lines of poetry in order to get people to grieve. That this idea of lamenting and lamentation poetry, something that is of the utmost importance. My master's dissertation speaks to the importance, and I really believe that lamentation poetry is the reason why that the story of Karbara still remains. In fact, I have a really long title for my master's dissertation, which states, which is entitled, The Role of Lamentation Poetry in Safeguarding the Karbara Narrative During the Imami Period. Fancy academic title, you see what I got? <laughs> and that if it were not for lamenting for Imam and Hussein, by means of the prose and the poetry that we had from the times of Ahlul Bayt until this very day, we see just how challenging it would have been for us to really receive the message in the way that we perceived it. You go ahead and take a look at the history of this institution, my friends. Do you have any idea how much of a blessing it is that we can have a measureless for Imam Hussein salam in the middle of downtown Manhattan in public? No one's going to say anything to us. We can perform the rituals the way that we want. Some people, they might ask questions, they might observe, they might not understand what we're doing, and that's okay, we can explain those things. But we don't fear for our lives. You go to other parts of the world to enter into a majlis of Imam Hussein, they're going to pat you down. They're going to open up your bags. And how many people and how many acts of violence are going to transpire, honestly, in the next 10 days? As much as I hope that it's not going to happen. I'm going to open up my phone just tomorrow morning and I'm going to see what happened in Afghanistan. And I'm going to see what happened in Iraq. And I'm going to see what happened in Pakistan. In the majlis of Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. For what? Because people want to sit down and they want to grieve for the grandson of the messenger of God. Let people do what it is that they want to do. But it was poetry that was recited, oftentimes even code words during the time of the Umayyads, during the time of the Abbasids, they would not even say the name of Hussein openly, but they would utilize other words. And there was even revolutions that were formed and that were created, and uprisings in small pockets during the time of the Umayyads, during the time of the Abbasids, the way that they were able to create those revolutions was by words of poetry in which they would state, we're not making a political statement, we're just grieving over Hussein in other instances. If you go ahead and you take a look at the richness of this treasure that we have in honor of Sayyid al-Shahda al Hussein alayhi salam, you really begin to appreciate what it is that we have. And I'll just elaborate with this last point and then I'll make my conclusions. And that is that we have to make sure that we're cultivating an environment whereby we're creating poetry in the English language as well that's as just as impactful, that's just as emotional, that's just as powerful, that's just as salient to the feature of our majlis in this part of the world today. So it's really important that if you have skills, and even if you don't have skills, all you have to do is recite one line and you get paradise, man. Why wouldn't you do it? You don't want to share it, you don't want to recite it in front of everyone, then you go and you post it online. You're doing a service toward the Prophet and toward his family, peace and blessings be upon them. And eventually we're going to have to tra transition from our um, classical languages and really be able to portray the message of Imam Hussein in a language that we all understand. So let's start making those efforts and encouraging like the efforts of all of like these amazing young poets 
uh, who recited just right now and who are going to be reciting over the next 10 nights and give them words of encouragement and tell them that it was amazing. And even if it wasn't amazing, tell them it was amazing. <laughs> I'm kidding, it was amazing. I was talking about my daughter, for instance, who was going to come here and spit some lines for you all. She was too shy tomorrow, inshallah. We need to encourage it. And we need to cultivate it. And we need to create it. And we need to build it. Because the foundation of these gatherings is not going to end anytime soon, man. How many times they try to kill us? How many times they try to blow us up? How many times they come to our mosque and shoot us? Or in all honesty. Not to be sarcastic, but to be completely honest. How much blood was shed? I tell you that Farazda was in prison, and Kumaita bin Zaid was in prison, and Di'bar al Khazai had the watchful eye over him, and Ibn Sikit had his tongue cut out from him. And even in more contemporary times, the famous poet Sibtay Ja'far was also killed for his praises of Ahlul Bayt. How many years ago? Five years ago? Day after day, year after year, this is what keeps the memory of Hussein alive. So we will enliven it. Ihyu amrana rahimallah min ahya amrana. As the hadith states from numerous of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Enliven our affairs. Tell people our stories. May Allah have mercy upon the one who enlivens our affairs. A man is approached by Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, or Imam Sadiq approaches one of his companions, a man by the name of Fudayl. And he states, O oh, Fudayl, Ya Fudayl, atajlisun wa tatahaddathun. O oh, Fudayl, did you sit down with one another? Do you gather with other followers of Ahl al-Bayt? Remember, they had to do it in secret back then. So he couldn't even say, do you sit down with other Shia? Do you sit down with my other followers? He would say, do you guys sit? Do you guys talk? You can sit and talk about anything. But he says, O oh, Fudayl, do you sit and do you talk? He says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I get it, and we do. To which he says, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon those gatherings. What was he talking about sitting? What was he talking about gathering? He's talking about sitting and talking about the heaven bait. Do you sit and do you gather and recollect the tragedy of our master Hussein? And he says, yes. To which he says, May Allah have mercy upon your gatherings. May Allah have mercy upon you all. May Allah have mercy upon those tears which come down from your cheeks. May Allah have mercy upon that pain that you feel in your heart in love for us. Have mercy upon the scream that is made in compassion for us. Scream, the cry, the pain, the tears, the grief, everything. Adam Bayt prayed for us when we make those sighs, when we hear the tragedy of Adam Bayt. And tonight is the first night in which we build, the first night in which we begin the journey to the tenth of Muharram. I don't know about you all, but the whole entire day until the sun set heart was feeling really sad because I know what tonight represents. Tonight is the night of the first of Muharram, a night when Imam al-Rada alayhi salam, he would be seen grieving and he would be seen weeping. A night, for instance, when Imam al-Kadim alayhi salam, he would recommend his companions the next night that they should fast in order that their heart becomes soft from sin, so they're able to grieve over the tragedy of Sayyid al-Shahada al Hussein. That on this particular night, Ahlul Bayt السلام, their moods would change. And they would make sure that their followers would also be fixated in understanding the significance of this particular night. This particular night, perhaps, because on the second of Muharram was when the caravan of Imam al Hussein السلام, it arrives in the holy city of Kanbara. And we'll talk about that more tomorrow night. But tonight is the last night that Hussein and his caravan is not in Karbala. So there's still a little bit of hope. And every single night during these ten nights of Muharram, we have a little bit of hope. But every single night, one horseman falls and one flag falls. And a little bit of that water is lost. And every night, 
We begin this journey thinking that the 10th of Muharram will it really happen again. But we recollect that tragedy unlike no other. And it is stated that upon one occasion that the Prophet ﷺ becomes home from the masjid and he enters into the house of Ali and Fatima. And Hassan and Hussein, they were three and two years old, or four and three, or five and four, or maybe even younger. He enters and he goes into the room and he begins to say his prayers. And then he exits from the room and his beard is soaked with his own tears. And he calls, Ya Hassan, Ya Hussein, oh my two sons, come to me. Imam Hassan and Hussein, they sit on the lap of their grandfather, the Messenger of God. And it is said that Imam al Hassan salam, he is seated on the right lap of the Prophet of God, and he embraces Imam al Hassan. And he calls out, Hal Hassani wal Hussein, Rayyan Atai, that these two sons, they are my flowers, they are the things that are most valuable to me. Al Hassani wal Hussein, Sayyida Shabab Ahl al Jannah, that these are the youths of paradise, that I love the one who loves these two children. And remember, Imam Hassan is maybe four years old, maybe three years old, four years at max. And he goes and he begins to kiss him on the mouth, and he begins to kiss him on the cheek, and he begins to embrace him. And then he looks to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and he kisses him on the forehead and then he begins to kiss him on the neck. And Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he looks at the Messenger of God and he gets down from his lap and he runs toward Fatima al Zahra. He runs toward his mother. And he says, Oh, my mother, smell my mouth. To which Fatima al Zahra, she kneels down on the ground and she kisses Imam al Hussein on the mouth and she says that your fragrance from your mouth is so beautiful. And she says that, oh my mother, how come that my grandfather kissed the mouth of my brother Hassan but did not do it for me? So at this moment, Fatima al Sahra says, I don't know. So it is said that she exits from that space and she goes toward the Prophet and she says, oh my father, Ya Rasulullah, you've hurt my son Hussein. He's upset that you embraced Hassan in a different way than you embraced Hussein. Why did you do that? He says, oh my daughter Fatima, I was sitting in the room and I was praying and after I completed my prayer, Jibra'il came to me with revelation. And he says, oh messenger of God, do you love your family? He says, I love my family. He says, do you love Hassan and Hussein? He said, I love Hassan and Hussein. He says, I want to tell you what is going to transpire toward your two children, Hassan and Hussein. And at this moment, the Prophet of God, he says to Fatima al-Sahra, his daughter, he says, I did not mean to offend Hussein, but I kissed the mouth of Hassan because he will be fed poison in many years from now that will, do, that will lead toward his martyrdom. And he says, I began to kiss the neck and the chest of your son Hussein because on the tent of Muharram, there's going to be a man who's going to sit on the chest of Hussein and sever his head from his body. And at this moment, Fatima al Zahra, she says, Oh, my father, tell me, for tell me what is going to happen to my two children. To which the Prophet ﷺ narrates that which Jibra'il has told him. And after that, Fatima al Zahra, she is overwhelmed by grief. She is overwhelmed by the tragedy. She does not ask any other question but what? She says, Oh, my grandfather, oh, my father Muhammad, tell me. Who is going to grieve for my sons Hassan and Hussein? She doesn't say, when is this going to happen? She doesn't say, who is going to be there to help me? The only thing that she asks is, if you and I are not going to be there, then who is going to grieve for my son Hussein? And at this moment, the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Oh my daughter Fatima, in a day, many days from this one, generation after generation, there are going to be men from my Ummah who are going to weep over your son Hussein. And there are going to be women from different generations who are going to weep for your women. And at this moment, Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, she says, and then what? To which the Prophet alayhi salam says, Oh Fatima, and on the day of judgment for every tear that falls down from their eye, you will intercede for them on the day of judgment and catch it and allow for them to enter into paradise. Ala lahmatullah, ala
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by our grief and by our love for Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by Hussein wa jaddihi wa abi wa ummihi wa akhi wa tisati al-maqsumin min dhurriyatihi salawatuka alayhi wa ismaeen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins by our love for Hussein. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us paradise by our love for Hussein. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the opportunity to serve Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and his grandfather Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow for the success of these majadis over the next 10 nights and allow for it to be a means and a mechanism for the transformation of our hearts. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahumma ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa ala ala bayta wa ala 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 